Today, I'm gonna show you how to make takeout quality beef and broccoli in less than 15 minutes using a cooking technique that I used to think wasn't practical for home cooks. To get started, I'll need some beef. Today, I've got one pound of beef flank steak. Flank steak is great for Chinese stir fries because it's loose, straight muscle grain stays tender when cooked with very high heat. Another great option if you can't find flank steak would be some type of sirloin steak. This is sirloin flap, but any type of sirloin that you can find would work well. Now to prep this flank, I'm gonna cut it into three two and a half inch wide strips like this. Then I'll turn one of them 90 degrees and slice it thinly on a bias. Cutting the beef like this gives us more surface area and more surface area means faster cooking and more browning. I'll cut all three strips into pieces that are about one inch tall, an eighth inch thick and two inches wide. Once I've got the whole pound and a half or half kilo of meat sliced like this, I'm gonna move the bowl over to the sink and rinse off the meat. This is mainly an opportunity to give this meat a little bit of tough love and break down some of the protein structure to make it more tender. This is also the first step in a process called velveting, which Chinese chefs use to make tougher, cheaper cuts of meat much more tender in the face of aggressive high heat cooking. The next step is the marination with a base. So once my beef is massaged and washed like this, I'll add in five grams or a splash of soy sauce, five grams or a splash of Chinese cooking wine, more on what that is and subs for it in just a second, then 10 grams of sesame oil, two grams of sugar, two grams of cornstarch, and then two grams of baking soda. The baking soda is the active ingredient in this process called velveting. The main mechanism, as far as I understand it, is that bases, like baking soda, stop meat proteins from linking together while cooking. That basically makes them easier to chew, also known as more tender. The opposite of this would be using an acid like lime juice to cook meat in ceviche. Once I've given this beef a thorough massage and it's all covered in marinade, I'm going to set it off to the side for five to 10 minutes while I quickly prep out the rest of this dish. Today and most days when I'm making stir fry, I choose to use broccolini. Broccolini can be kind of pricey and I know not everyone's gonna have access to it. So of course, Western style broccoli would work great or Chinese broccoli if you can get that as well. Whatever type of broccoli you have in total, we need about 12 ounces or 350 grams cut into pretty small pieces that are no larger than one and a half to two inches on the florette side and a half inch on the stem side. Next, I'll take a quarter of a large white onion and slice it thinly. I've been really digging the sweet roasty flavor of onions in high heat stir fries lately. And for me, beef is almost all always made better with a few onions nearby. Next, my aromatics. For that, I'll grab my trusty microplane and zest a knob of unpeeled ginger. I've said it a few times on the channel already and I'll repeat it. You don't need to peel ginger if you're grating it. The skin is thin and doesn't taste like anything. I've also got five cloves of garlic here and I'm gonna give those a grate as well. In total, I need 10 grams of both garlic and ginger pulped up like this. Lastly, our stir fry sauce. For that, I'll combine 10 grams of sugar, 30 grams of soy sauce, 45 grams of oyster sauce, or hoisin if you can't get oyster, and then 30 grams of Shaoxing Chinese cooking wine. If you haven't heard of it, Shaoxing is a fermented rice wine that has a distinctive amber color and a musty aged aroma. The bottle that I have has added salt in it, which is very surprising when you're expecting to taste something called wine. Either way, it makes this dish taste awesome. Just keep an eye on the salt level. An alternative here would be dry sherry, if you have that on hand. I generally do because I think it's essential in dishes like chicken pot pie or French onion soup, but if you don't have that, white wine would also work. A quick stir to combine and that's our sauce. One detail that I wanna share about making Asian dishes is that the thing that usually slows me down is having to track down all of the different bottles of things that I need to make the sauce or the marinade. So to make that easier and faster, I started keeping all of my Asian stuff in one tote so that I can just pull it out of my pantry and put it away as one unit. Now the last little bit of prep for this dish is gonna to be to combine a teaspoon of cornstarch and like two to three tablespoons of water or about 30 to 40 grams. Corn Cornstarch is an essential part of thickening Chinese stir fry sauces and having it as a standalone slurry as opposed to mixed directly into the sauce allows us to throttle the amount of thickening up or down after the sauce is in the pan, keeping us from making it gloppy and over thickened. Now, once I've got all my prep sorted out, it's time to get down to biz. For that, I'm gonna grab my well-seasoned 12 inch carbon steel wok. Wok cooking at home is something that I resisted pretty heavily until recently. I thought it wasn't practical for the home cook basically. If you've seen most of my videos, you'll know that I traditionally have preferred to adapt stir fry recipes for nonstick pans, mainly because I figured that that's the tool that most people watching these videos have in their kitchen. And I still stand by those recipes as being good, but once I actually got a wok and started cooking with it three or four times a week to figure it out, I realized that woks are awesome and they're much easier to work with than I thought. 
This particular wok is from the cookware company and sponsor of this part of the video, Made In. Made In asked me a few months back what cookware of theirs I would be most interested in, and since I've been wok curious for a long time, I finally got one. I'm basically a wok guy now, and one of the things that I really love about this carbon steel wok in particular is that it acts kind of like a hybrid between a cast iron and a stainless steel pan. And like a cast iron pan, it can be seasoned to have a natural nonstick surface and can cook pretty much anything a nonstick pan can. Besides being a a great vehicle for stir frying, the depth of this wok also makes it versatile enough to braise or deep fry in. And as a company, I really like what Made In is doing. They partner with multi-generational factories and artisans to bring you a curated collection of materials and shapes that you need in the kitchen, like this 12-inch frying pan or this two-quart saucepan that I've been using on loop in my videos for the past few months. Made In designs professional quality products for the home cook, but their kitchenware is also used in Michelin-starred restaurants. So to check this stuff out for yourself, Maiden is offering 10% off your first purchase with the link in my description. Now I'll drop this wok over high heat on my most powerful burner and then, very importantly, I'll turn on my hood vent. Just like searing other things indoors with high heat, cooking with a wok is super smoky, so if you don't have proper ventilation, hmm, maybe do this with lower heat in a nonstick pan or choose a different recipe, up to you. Now, once this wok is ripping hot or somewhere above 550F, it's time to cook this thing. First, I'll add a long squeezer of high smoke point oil like canola or peanut around the edge of the wok, about a tablespoon's worth, and then I'll add in half of my marinated beef right into the center of the wok. From there, I'll come back with some silicone tipped tongs or a wooden spoon and give this an aggressive stir and toss to get it evenly coated with the oil. In total, I'll be cooking this first half of the beef for 60 to 90 seconds, depending on the heat of the wok and how fast the beef takes on color. I'll toss it every 20 to 30 seconds to get some new meat touching the pan and to get some of that wok flavor into the meat. When the meat hits the edges of the hot pan, the steam on it's gonna vaporize and some of the oil on it is gonna sizzle up and that makes it taste super dynamic, kind of smoky and very alive. After 60 to 90 seconds, this meat has some nice browning on the outside and it's cooked about 80 to 90% through. So I'm gonna scoot this over to a bowl to hang out and then I'll drop my wok back at the stove. A long squeezer of oil, then in goes the second half of my beef and same deal as before, a quick toss and about 60 to 90 seconds of very, very aggressive high heat cooking. Once this beef's got some good color and is mostly cooked through, I'll move it over to the holding bowl with round one and then drop the wok back on the burner over high heat. At this point, as you can see, the wok is all gunked up with beef stuff and we need to get that out of here so it doesn't burn. So I'll add in a small splash of water to deglaze the wok and then use a damp paper towel to wipe it out thoroughly. I'll give this another 30 seconds to get back up into the danger zone heat wise and then in goes another rough tablespoon spoon of oil around the edges and then half of my broccolini and half of my onions. Next, I'll jump in just like before to give these veggies a thorough shakedown to get them evenly coated with oil and give them a heavy dose of that smoky hot wok flavor. And if you're wondering, hey Bri, can I still make this recipe in a nonstick pan? Well, yes, you can make something that is approximately what we're going for here, but with a nonstick pan, you're stuck below 450F and that's just not hot enough to open up the wild dynamic flavors of these high heat Asian stir fries. It's kind of like cooking a pizza at 400 versus 650F. The one in the hotter oven is just gonna be better in terms of texture and flavor and will have a life to it that you just can't get with less intense heat. Once the broccoli and onions are charred around the edges and have a snappy tenderness to them, I'll move them over to the bowl with the beef and then drop the pan one last time. Another tablespoon squirt of oil and then I'll add in my second half of broccoli and onions. I'll give those another 60 to 90 seconds to get the tasty snap of a wok fried veggie and then once they're well fried off, I'll add in my garlic and ginger. Now a quick toss to get those opened up, but be quick about it because this is a 600 degree pan and that finely grated stuff is gonna burn at about 20 seconds. Next, I'll add in all of my previously stir fried beef and vegetables, and they're gonna bring along a little bit of moisture to deglaze the pan and get the ginger and garlic steaming instead of burning. From here, I'll give this a fold and a toss to get everything combined for maybe 15 to 20 seconds, and then in goes my stir fry sauce. Notice that I'm pouring this around the edges of the hot wok. That's so I can get some instantaneous evaporation and caramelization. It kind of like sears the sauce and brings a ton of flavor along the way. Once the sauce is in, I'll add in two to three tablespoons or about 30 grams of my thin 
cornstarch slurry. I didn't use all of it, as you can see. I'll save the rest for if it's looking a touch thin. And from here, I'll give this one last set of tosses and folds to get this sauce reduced, thickened, and glazing up the meat and veggies. You guys, this dish is miles better than pretty much anything you can get takeout, and it only takes 15 minutes start to finish. It's sweet, it's salty, it's umami, and has a ton of clean, steaky beef flavor. Plus, I think this dish is a great introduction into wok cooking, as is this book on wok cookery by culinary demigod, J. Kenji Lopez Alt. This recipe is a slightly tweaked variation of Kenji's from the book, and he's awesome, this book is awesome, and it's one of the best I've read in a long time. Link in the description. Anyways, beef and broccoli is easy to make and tastes mega dope. I hope you guys try it soon. Let's eat this thing.